Well, uh, I'd like to thank uh, thank you uh, for um, for asking me to speak uh, today, and thank you to all, all the organisers uh, of, of this meeting. Um, I'm a second year PhD student. Um, my name is Ivan Amasvam, and I'm working at Sheffield University with Professor Wynne Stanley. And I'd like to present some research that I've been doing uh, at Sheffield, entitled "The Vacuum Polarization in Three Dimensional Antistatistic Space Time with Robin Boundary Conditions." So we work in the semi-classical approach to quantum gravity, whereby um, the metric uh, is kept in its fixed and classical form. And we study a quantum field propagating on this background metric. And whilst we will be studying um, the expectation value of the stress energy tensor in due course, for the time being, we've been focused on the expectation value of the square of the scalar field in a state A, which you've heard earlier on is known as a vacuum polarization. When that state is a vacuum state, we refer to the vacuum expectation value or the vacuum polarization. And when we have a thermal state, uh, we refer to the thermal expectation value uh, characterized by the inverse temperature beta. So our background space time is three dimensional anti-de-sitter space, which is a maximally symmetric solution to Einstein's field equation with a constant negative curvature. Its metric is shown here, where L is the length scale, which we set to one, and rho is our radial coordinate, which runs from zero to pi over two, and pi over two being the space-time boundary. Theta is the angular coordinate, and interestingly, time is periodic in ADS and runs from minus pi to pi, where minus pi and pi are, are identified. And so we have this somewhat unphysical closed time-like curves, and you can see that here in the uh, two-dimensional metric where the angular coordinate is removed, and you can see these sort of unphysical closed time-like curves. And to try and circumvent this, we consider the covering uh, space, whereby the met whereby essentially the, the, the time coordinate is unwrapped and runs from minus infinity to infinity. So we will be studying a free real scalar field phi, uh, satisfying this Klein-Gordon equation, whereby the box here is the D'Alembertian operator in curved space. M is the mass of the field. Uh, R is the Ricci scalar, which is given here, um, and Xi is the coupling constant, which couples the field to the Ricci scalar. So for a conformally coupled field Xi in three dimensions, Xi is one over eight. We also define an, uh, another term nu, uh, which is given here as the square root of one plus mu squared L squared, where mu squared uh, essentially uh, involves the mass and the coupling constant, the Ricci scalar. And, and the reason for, 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 for doing this is because whilst a lot of um, studies uh, have looked at essentially the massless conformally coupled field where nu is one half, uh, we will be able to look at the field with general mass and coupling by looking at different values of nu between zero and one. So as antidecitor space is not globally hyperbolic, even, even the covering space is not, is not globally hyperbolic, we have to impose boundary conditions on a radial solution at the time like boundary at rho, rho because pi over two in order to generate to get a meaningful dynamics. And the commonest boundary conditions that have been studied in the past are Dirichlet, where the value of the field vanishes at the boundary, and Neumann, where the derivative of the field vanishes at the boundary. But we can also look at another uh, boundary condition called Robin boundary conditions, which are essentially a linear combination of Dirichlet and Neumann par parameterized by so-called Robin parameter, which I've labeled here as zeta, um, which runs between zero and pi. And you can see that for zeta is zero, we recover the Dirichlet boundary condition. And for uh, zeta is uh, pi over two, we recover the Neumann boundary condition. So before we, we, get, we go on to uh, looking at the Robin boundary condition, I, 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 we've determined the vacuum polarization with just Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. And, to, and, tant and paramount in this is the determination of the Feynman's Green's function, which, are, which is defined here as the expectation value of the time ordered product of the fields. And the Feynman Green's function satisfies this uh, PD, this inhomogeneous PDE, where again we have the Dalembertian operator here. G is the metric of the, uh, uh, sorry, is the determinant of the metric that we've just shown. And delta here is a three dimensional Dirac delta function. Now we know that uh, the Green's functions uh, with Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions respect the maximum symmetry of the background space-time. So we can actually express our Green's function not just as a function of two space-time points, but as a function of the geodesic distance between the two space-time points, which are called S here. 
And of course, as we bring the space time points together, as we've heard previously, our Green's function is divergent. And so in order to get a meaningful result, we employ Hadamard renormalization. And the Hadamard parametric in three dimensions is given here. And, and this is different to the one you saw before because in Peter's talk, because that was actually the Hadamard parametric in four dimensions. So this in three dimensions, it's life is a bit easier. We don't have that logarithmic term. Um, so again, U and W here are biscalars, which are regular in the coincidence limit. And sigma here is sometimes called Singe's world function, which is half of this square of the geodesic distance between the two space-time points. And we can show that the divergent part of the Hadamard parametrics is given here as well, I over four pi S. And with this, we can now determine the expectation value of the square of the field by subtracting the divergent part of the Hadamard parametrics from the Feynman's Green's function and taking the limit as we bring the space-time point together. So these are the vacuum uh, Green's functions that we've derived. I've left out all these detailed calculations for time purposes, but this is the um, vacuum Dirichlet Green's function. This is the vacuum Neumann's Green's functions. And essentially they are composed of hypergeometric functions. So the F here are hypergeometric functions and these are the parameters within them. And you can see that they are dependent on nu, which uh, encodes information about the mass and the coupling constant of the field. And also, in, and also depend on the geodesic distance between the two space-time points. But interestingly, they don't depend on rho, on the, on the radial coordinates, so they actually respect the maximum symmetry of the background space-time. And the difference between the Neumann and the Dirichlet is actually just the sign of the first term. Now, we can calculate the thermal Green's functions as an infinite sum of the um, vacuum Green's functions, which we've done here. And leaving a lot of the sort of background calculation out, we can I can show you what our the thermal Green's functions are with both Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions, and uh, these are an infinite sum of, of again uh, hypergeometric functions. Again, they depend on our parameter nu, but also unlike the vacuum case, they depend on the radial coordinate rho. So these don't respect the maximum symmetry of the best space time, and in fact are dependent on the spatial location. Again, the difference between the um, Neumann and Dirichlet terms is in the sign uh, of the first term. Unfortunately, these sums actually converge quite quickly. So from the previous slide, we can now calculate the uh, renormalized uh, vacuum polarization uh, with Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. They have both been shown to be a constant and they're shown here. Uh, they differ only in the sign but are, and again are independent of the uh, space-time coordinate, but depend only on new, so essentially they depend only on the mass and the coupling constant. Now for the thermal expectation values, um, because the divergences are common or are, are independent of the state and are common in both terms, we've essentially just looked at the difference between the thermal states and the vacuum states, and then subsequently added on the already renormalized vacuum expectation value. So this is what, basically what, we, what we've been dealing with uh, here for both the Riesley and the Neumann uh, cases. And, but these have to be calculated numerically um, with Mathematica. So these are the results now for the thermal expectation values with both the Riesley and Neumann uh, boundary conditions. So, so these are the three dimensional surface plots. So just to orientate you, this is the vacuum polarization. This is the thermal expectation value of the square of the field on the vertical axis. And on the bottom axis, we have the radial coordinate rho, which runs from the origin to the space-time boundary at pi over two. And we also have nu here uh, on the other axis. So uh, level of 0.5 is the massless conformally coupled field. And you can see that for the, um, thermal expectation value with Dirichlet boundary conditions, as we approach the space-time boundary, the expectation value progressively decreases. And in fact, at the boundary, it becomes the vacuum expectation value. As we increase new, our expectation values uh, decrease progressively until we reach new equals one. For the Neumann boundary condition, in fact, at new equals zero, we actually have the same result as we do for the Dirichlet. It just looks different because we're on different scales. Uh, so at new equals zero, uh, Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions give the same result. However, unlike for Dirichlet, as we increase new, our uh, thermal expectation values progressively increase and in fact diverge at new equals one. 
So at Newark, Newark as well, we only have Dirichlet boundary condition and not um, Neumann. So now we turn our attention towards the vacuum polarization with Robin boundary conditions. And to do this, we work in Euclidean space by performing a wick rotation of the metric as shown here. So this is the um, ADS3 metric in Euclidean space. And the Euclidean Green's functions obey a similar PDE as we've shown before. This is now the D'Alembertian in Euclidean space. Uh, and this is still the three dimensional Dirac delta function. Now we use the Fourier transforms of the delta function to give us an ANSAT for the both the vacuum and the thermo Euclidean Green's function, which are shown here. Note the integral form of the Fourier transform for the vacuum uh, Green's function, and we have the the sum uh, form uh, for the thermo Green's function. Here, kappa is two pi over beta, and g here is our um, radial Green's functions, and we employ the boundary conditions on the radial Green's function at the, at the space time boundary. So I'll just run through these. So there are results now. These are the numerical results that we've got with our uh, vacuum expectation value for the Robin boundary condition. So we fixed new equals a, a three quarter. I mean, I've, I've, I've done it for different values of new, but I'll just show you the results with new equals three quarters. And we've studied different values of the uh, Robin parameter. So we have the, the vacuum expectation value on the vertical axis here and our radial coordinate on the horizontal axis where pi over two is a space-time boundary. So when zeta is zero, we have the Dirichlet boundary condition, which is a constant as we've shown before. And when, uh, so when, when, when zeta is pi over two, we have the Neumann boundary condition, which is again constant. But we looked at zeta values or the Robin parameters between um, zero and pi over two, and also uh, above pi over two. And you can see that as we approach the space-time boundary, uh, for all Robin parameters considered, the, expect the, the vacuum expectation values approach the Neumann result at the space-time boundary, whereas Dirichlet keeps its own value. Thermal results, the thermal expectation values, we have um, a very similar finding. This time we're looking at uh, nu is one quarter and uh, the beta is a four. So again, the dotted lines represent the um, Dirichlet expectation value and the Neumann expectation value here. But you can see that in fact, that um, unlike the vacuum case with the thermal expectation values, the um, the expectation values are, are dependent on the space-time position. It's quite subtle here with the Dirichlet norming, but it but it, it does actually progressively decrease as we approach the boundary. And for all the Robin parameters studied, we find again that as we approach the space-time boundary, the thermal expectation values of the vacuum polarization approach the Neumann result at the space-time boundary, whereas the Dirichlet uh, keeps its own value. And this is something that we found for all values of new. Uh, and all values of beta as well. So in conclusion, um, we have found that the vacuum expectation values of the vacuum polarization with Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions are constant. Um, this was shown before with the Dirichlet in a previous study in our department, um, but we've, we've now shown that this to be the case for, for Neumann boundary conditions as well. We have found that the thermal expectation values of the vacuum polarization approach the corresponding vacuum expectation values at the space-time boundary for all values of new. And also we found that for both the vacuum expectation value and thermal expectation value with Robin boundary condition, they reached the Neumann value at the space-time value for all Robin parameters and new, except Dirichlet, which has its own um, different limit. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Siva, for this nice presentation and perfect timing. We have plenty of time for questions, so please raise your hand. Okay, Gerardo asks if you could comment on what did you expect for higher dimensions? Higher dimension. The, it's, 
previous work in our department has looked at the vacuum polarization of four dimensions, but just in the massless conformally coupled case and found the same result that the vacuum polarization with Robin parameters does converge towards a Neumann result at the space time boundary. But that was just in the massless conformally coupled case. And so we were keen to see whether this actually happens for the general mass and coupling, which it does appear to be, at least in three dimensions anyway. And I assume that it will be the same in four dimensions. So we started off in three dimensions because it was just good to try and get all the theory done and the, um, the maths done first before we progress up the four dimensions. Uh, but I expect the same to find that we would find the same in, in, in higher dimensions. Okay, I wanted to ask uh, if do you intend to do similar calculations on rotating space times that are similar to ADA? Yeah, um, well, the plan is next to look at TMU new, so stress energy tensor. So we're going to look at that for general mass and coupling in four dimensions. And then we'll actually perhaps look at the BTZ black hole, which is three dimensional black hole, which is asymptotically ADS. Um, whether we'll go on to rotating black holes in the future, I don't know, um, but we might not have time. But, um, but yeah, but yeah, we will certainly want to extend this work to mm -hmm. looking at asymptotically black ADS black holes at some some stage. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.